Hi and welcome back to this new lecture in the computer security module. Um, today we will talk about a new standard uh, for representing security information called the Security Assertion Markup Language or what's better known as SAML and uh, we will also look at one of its implementations um, also broadly used called um, Shibboleth. <coughs> So we start with the SAML or the Security Assertion Markup um, language. So first of all, what is SAML? Uh, SAML is an OAS, again an OASIS standard for representing information or representing data uh, which are relevant to security. Uh, so security of resources, security of um, systems, and so on. Okay. So if you wanted to say something about uh, some user for example and that uh, something you're saying um, is related to a protocol a security protocol in which you will be engaged with some service provider then the way for you to represent that information uh, can be uh, via this um, uh, language um, which is a uh, security assertion markup language. Um, so it's, as I said, it's an OASIS standard. You can find the specification for SAML on the OASIS uh, website. <clears throat> um, and it gives us some kind of a framework for exchanging security information about uh, subjects. Okay. Um, it's not just a, a format or a language for representing um, the assertions themselves but also it, it gives us a, a complete um, framework in the sense that you also get descriptions of uh, how what kind of protocols you need and what kind of processing rules and so on so um, this is the probably the old picture that we um, uh, used earlier on in the unit and um, or an abstraction of it where user attempts to access some kind of resource okay so uh, you're a subject and you would like to gain access to a printer or a server or whatever it is um, so the general format of uh, most protocols will be in this um, uh, way or in this kind of model uh, where you first of all try to access the resource um, and the resource or the resource provider or the service provider will come back at you and say well could you show me some security information so that I can reach a decision as to whether you're authorized or not authorized to access the resource and then you give them uh, that information and then they come back to you and say well actually this information is okay according to our policies um, or that this information is not okay again according to our policies and therefore you can't get access to the uh, resource okay so this is the general the general view and saml attempts to kind of address this um, uh, view by providing a standard way of uh, carrying out these um, first of all carrying out these protocols um, and also a standard way of representing the information which is being exchanged uh, between the subject and the uh, resource provider or the service provider <clears throat> so we can say that the general goal behind saml is that for a service provider instead of authenticating directly a user it, it will only have to validate some security information about the user okay so before we uh, took the view that um, in order for me to to understand who you are and therefore understand what kind of permissions you may have um i i could have selected any number of uh, authentication protocols um, and challenged you with those uh, protocols um, however <clears throat> in this case here uh, saml's philosophy is that you don't need that but rather what you need is um, just the amount of information that you're requiring um, and that information of course uh, later on will drive internally your uh, policy uh, decision-making uh, process according for example 
to an XACML uh, policy that you have um, in your uh, internal databases. <clears throat> and hence, we can move from a single system to a distributed system worldview. So SAML uh, provides uh, this um, new concept, uh, which is um, what we call an identity provider. Okay, so uh, you can think of the identity provider as any uh, provider which um, holds some information about yourself um, and they're able to um, provide that information in the form of security tokens or what we call credentials that they can give to any entity uh, from which you are requesting services or resources okay so in that sense an identity provider or an idp is in fact a security information provider okay uh, now in modern day um, landscape of technology an identity provider could be somebody like your uh, university, okay, so when you attempt to access a resource, external resource, um, they may refer you back to your university uh, where you can authenticate yourself and then get access to that uh, resource. Or it could be um, any of the social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, um, any of those uh, social media uh, platforms where you have an account with um, and then you attempt to access some kind of external business uh, and they say well actually could you um, authenticate yourself with the with your uh, Facebook account for example okay. so these are um, just some instances of um, of this concept of an identity provider or an IDP Often the interaction will be in this format, so um, either yourself or the service provider will ask the IDP if they uh, hold enough uh, security credentials, enough security information about you, about you as a subject, and then they will uh, come back saying, okay, yes, we do, and so therefore here is what we call an assertion, okay, or a token. Uh, containing that information or no we don't therefore we, we can't send you any such assertions um, so this is the IDP is the is the um, source of the information now the sink for the information or the consumer of the information will be um, uh, what we call a service provider or SP okay so the service provider uh, will take such assertions um, from either yourself as a subject or directly from the identity provider and then will um, uh, if that if those uh, tokens and assertions um, if the information inside them satisfies the internal security policies uh, for that provider then they will um, release or provide you with the service or release the resource to you um, as requested. <clears throat> so as, as such, this service provider is the consumer of this um, security information token and the identity provider is the source of that token. <clears throat> so as I said, um, SAML is a uh, or in Oasis uh, standard, um, you can uh, refer to the Oasis website for uh, the various versions of, of SAML. Um, we stay here at a, quite a shallow level because we're constrained with time um, and you can focus on version 2 of SAML that will be sufficient for you to gain um, the, the fundamental understanding um, of this language um, in a sufficient manner to, 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 this, uh, to this unit. Now, uh, SAML was born from a, an important use case um, a while ago, which is known as single sign-on. Okay, so the idea of single sign-on or cross-domain single sign-on is that you have uh, or is that you authenticate with 
website and then you use that authentication with that website to gain resources to a different website okay or services from a different website okay so the most um, familiar example um, is when you um, let's say um, have an account or register with some kind of an airline um, company or a holiday uh, company uh, or holiday website um, and then at the same time uh, that website will provide you not just services that belong to the um, uh, to its domain of business for example um, if you're booking flights but they also will uh, or can provide um, access for you uh, on for resources that belong to a completely different website uh, which could be for example a car rental um, company okay so they may have an agreement between them where you if you register with one you can uh, be trusted to use the services and the resources of the other uh, site okay so this this was the initial um, catalyst for um, SAML uh, to be born and um, it it came to be known as single sign-on. The technical term is single sign-on or cross-domain uh, single uh, sign-on. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, you can blow this up to a larger uh, kind of uh, scenario where um, you don't only have a single association between two websites, but you have multiple associations across um, a number of websites or across a number of uh, service uh, providers okay so in in our example the airline company may not only offer you access to a car rental company but also to a hotel booking uh, company so um, you could have then multiple services um, all trusting one single identity provider Okay. In more kind of um, modern setup nowadays, um, you could think of this as being um, the situation where you want to book your holiday and the holiday service provider will ask you to authenticate yourself, for example, through your Facebook um, identity. Okay, so in this case, Facebook is uh, your identity provider. Okay, so if you log in through Facebook, they will uh, accept that um, as a valid way of authenticating your identity, what, whatever kind of identity you have um, on Facebook. And then you can use that identity to access the car rental, the hotel booking, the airline booking, uh, whatever kind of service you're trying to access to, you know, um, book your uh, holidays. So this is uh, the wider view. This wider view is known as a federation, whereas the more kind of a <clears throat> constrained view of just having two um, administrative domains associated together with trust is known as single uh, sign. Um, so in a general way, the Trusted SAML Authority, which is your identity provider, will uh, provide the assertions for the requesting party, which could be the service provider, or it could be some kind of middle point, which is trying to uh, build up the workflow uh, for your business. Okay, so um, it's, it's trying to obtain these assertions so that uh, the whole workflow becomes uh, becomes possible um, and of course um, those assertions are provided in a response in what we call a SAML response uh, once the identity provider obtains the SAML uh, request or the SAML query from uh, that service provider now um, the assertions of course are just one um, aspect of it so the, the the data the assertions themselves which are data or messages are just one aspect uh, but of course we need to also understand how those assertions are communicated and that's what 
um, is known as the protocol or the SAML protocol itself uh, and actually how those are also processed and therefore what kind of processing rules we may have. Okay, so SAML covers all of these. We can't go all, all, over all of them because um, that would be uh, quite a lot of time to, to do that. Um, so we will constrain ourselves to just the most uh, fundamental aspects of uh, SAML, which is more related to the assertions uh, themselves. Uh, now, um, SAML defines an architecture, and uh, that architecture is uh, almost like onion-based, uh, where you have uh, four layers. Um, at the very core of it, as I said, are the assertions themselves, okay, so the actual message definitions, the actual data structure definitions, um, and these are related to uh, the way you represent the attributes about your subjects okay so how do you want to describe for example uh, my name my identity uh, my uh, telephone number date of birth uh, whatever information you want to provide about myself how are you going to represent that um, in an in what we call an assertion okay which is a data structure basically um, then the next layer is uh, the protocols. Um, so these basically define uh, things like the request response protocol for how you obtain those assertions, okay, um, and how you manage a federation, okay. So how you build up a federation consisting of multiple um, service providers and perhaps one or more identity providers. Um, then we have something we call bindings, and the idea of binding is basically um, um, similar to, uh, to implementation, okay? So um, you may have a protocol, a SAML protocol, defined um, using the SAML language, um, but um, a binding will tell you exactly how that protocol is going to be implemented okay so um, for example is it going to be implemented using soap is it going to be implementing using http you know what kind of technology what kind of communication technology are you going to use to implement that particular uh, saml protocol finally the top level um, or, the, or the outer layer um, uh, is what we call a profile so profile basically is like a, a use case where you you know you define a solution for a common problem so like uh, like like the SSO or the federated federated communication or federated system uh, use cases okay now uh, we will Stay more or less at the uh, core level, and if you are interested in any of the other layers, uh, with a little bit of coverage as well on the request response, but we will stick mostly around the assertion and the protocol layers. Okay, if you're interested um, to know more about the SAML uh, full stack of um, definitions, then you can consult their uh, specification document. So a SAML assertion um, consists of a number of information, um, important uh, core information. So that includes the issuer of the SAML. Okay, so who has issued the SAML assertion? Uh, the signature. Okay, so what was the signature of the issuer? Um, and that is important to protect the authenticity and integrity of that particular assertion or token. Uh, the subject, so who is this token about, or who is this assertion about? Uh, any conditions related to the validity of the assertion, for example, its um, time validity, um, and uh, advice, which is any other extra information that you need to mention about the other information that you're including in the assertion. Okay. And of course, also zero or more number of uh, what we call statements, and these can be um, generic statement or authentication 
statements or authorization decision statements or attribute statements okay so um, you can um, look at the description of these for the specification of SAML but uh, these generally include um, information about um, any of these aspects particularly when you're using it in the context of um, authenticating somebody uh, you may want to include the authentication information under the authentication statement for example um, so uh, this is uh, more or less um, part of the uh, uh, schema for the uh, subject element um, and as you can see here um, it contains um, it contains a number or um, a, a number of choices for representing the identity um, of the subject element. So um, th these identities could be either a base ID, so some kind of um, machine operated ID, uh, name ID, so this could be the name of the person or the subject, or indeed it could even be an encrypted ID, okay, so in, in cases where this particular token or assertion uh, needs to respect the privacy of the subject uh, for whom it is uh, being issued, okay, so you can encrypt their ID. Um, let, let's say maybe this was like an assertion used in the context of uh, health um, uh, information exchange or healthcare information exchange in that case uh, you may want to hide the identity of the uh, subject for whom you're providing this uh, token <clears throat> before you release it of course um, so here's an example of a full SAML assertion um, and we have here first of all the identity of the assertion the uh, date in which it was issued, the version, uh, and who is the issuer. So in this case, it is um, a site called example.com, for example. Uh, what's their identity? In this case, we're providing a name identity, an actual plain text name identity, and, they, and that is uh, somebody called Alice at example.com. Um, and moving on, um, we also have um, some conditions here on the validity or time validity, time and date validity of the uh, token. So it is not to be valid before this particular date and not to be valid after this particular date and time. Um, who is the old audience for this uh, token, i.e., in other words, who is it meant to be for? Um, who is the consumer or who, which service provider is this token meant to be for? If you wanted to constrain its uh, destination, the scope of its destination, you can do that using the audience um, element. Um, in the in the assertion in the SAML assertion, and in this case, it's a website for uh, called example uh, tool.com. And other information like in this case uh, some uh, additional definition of the information, which is a telephone number, and we give the value of that additional information, which is a particular telephone number that belongs to Alice um, at example.com. Okay, so this is. An example assertion that Alice could then use to gain access to certain services or resources perhaps perhaps offered um, or that will be offered by a service provider uh, website called example2.com. <clears throat> Now, um, we said that um, the other layer is what we call SAML protocol, and the SAML protocol defines, uh, basically defines um, a bunch of uh, protocols that allow you to set up and run your SAML system. The most important one is the query for a SAML assertion, so you get a 
you 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 can you can ask for a particular assertion and then you get the response uh, back generally most of these um, protocols are what we call request response type of protocols uh, meaning that they are quite simple um, or just simply that they can um, consist of a request and a response okay so you send a request could you please give me this information and the identity provider comes back saying okay here is the information uh, or sorry I can't give you that information for some some reason okay so there's a bunch of them um, and perhaps we stick just to the most fundamental one which is the uh, case when you query a SAML um, assertion um, so that's the um, format for um, <clears throat> these request for response uh, type uh, protocols um, so you have a request uh, coming in and that request gets processed um, at this, in your system and then you uh, provide a response to uh, back to the requester so the response could be either back to the request to themselves or it could go um, to someone different okay so it could go to a third entity perhaps um, you are requesting that the saml assertion uh, or the saml token to be actually forwarded to a third uh, party okay which could be for example the service provider themselves um, so here's what a request um, abstract type schema looks like um, so ba basically this is the information that you um, you could include um, in a request in a sample request okay so that includes uh, that information includes the issuer you know who who are you who, who are you exactly who is issuing this request um, your signature um, and your ID okay and the intended recipients for the request um, time of the request and whether consent has been obtained for the request okay so if you're forwarding this to a third party um, did you obtain consent from them to forward this token to the other uh, to, the th to that third party and of course there are some additional information here so um, how many minimum um, occurrences of this sh there should there should be if it's zero it means you can skip it <clears throat> and whether the information is either required or um, optional <clears throat> on the other hand a response um, what we call a status response um, schema looks like the following um, so this is the case where uh, once you obtain the request you do the processing of that request you assemble uh, the token and then you return the token back um, but that token being returned is part of your status response uh, that you're giving back to the requester or to the third party or the service provider uh, for whom you would you would like to forward that token uh, to <clears throat> so uh, this uh, response consists of a bunch of information again the issuer the signature uh, but most importantly the status itself okay so what was the status of the request was it successful unsuccessful um, if it's unsuccessful why was it unsuccessful um, and also the ID of the original request and the address of the destination to which the response uh, should be uh, going okay so um, it, it contains um, or it could contain um, this all this information um, but the most important one is of course the status because that tells us exactly what happened when the request um, came in okay so uh, the status itself um, is um, itself is a data structure uh, by itself and that can can consist um, of all this information but most importantly 
the status code. Okay, so the status code um, will be uh, some kind of code that tells me whether the um, request was successful and, and not successful and um, uh, so on. Okay, so and if it's uh, not successful, then why was it uh, not successful? For example, was it because the authentication failed uh, or perhaps that the IDP at the moment is busy and it's not responding anymore? Um, so now we move on to um, a couple of examples of profiles as well, actually. Um, and we look first of all at a web browser SSO profile. Okay, so as, we, as I said, these are uh, our profiles are basically the use cases. Okay, so the, they are the scenarios that uh, allow us to um, uh, define um, or allow us to use the technology, okay? Um, so the web browser SSO uh, profile um, example um, has a couple of um, instances for it. The first one is what we call a service provider initiated. And in this case, uh, the idea is that you as a client, you've got your browser on, um, you attempt to access a web page belonging to a service some kind of a service online um, then the uh, the service provider will redirect you to uh, some identity provider that they trust okay so this could be for example your university um, and the university then will challenge you to authenticate yourself if you're successful they will provide a response to you that you can send back to the original uh, service uh, provider and if they are happy with that uh, response which of course contains the SAML uh, token or SAML assertion or assertions um, then um, that will uh, allow them to provide you with whatever resource or service you requested in the first hand if you're unsuccessful then they will come back to you and say sorry um, your um, assertions are not good enough for us and we can't therefore provide you access to our services or resources. Um, there is a different version of that called the IDP or Identity Provider Initiated and um, this is just slightly different in the sense that it starts with you authenticating yourself at your identity provider first so this identity provider as we said could be your university or could be facebook or twitter or any identity provider uh, so first you authenticate yourself there and once you've done that you ask them to forward uh, the saml assertion to a particular service provider that you would like to access their resources or services from um, and if again if those assertions are valid then the service provider will then provide you with the resources or the services if they're not valid they will say sorry your assertions are not good enough according to our internal uh, policies now you could combine saml and exacamol um, in the following uh, format uh, basically um, if you are using exacamol um, you have the architecture for exacamol so you've got the pep the pdp your policy store um, and the resources you're trying to protect and then you've got the requesters or the subjects who would like to get access to those resources and pretty much most of the uh, communications or at least the front-end communication between the requester and the PEP uh, can be conducted using the SAML um, uh, language okay so um, you can think of SAML as, as sitting um, sort of sitting between your system uh, your organizational system which contains the resources and contains um, all the exacamol uh, stuff and you can think as SAML as being that kind of interface uh, between your Xacomol and between your uh, subjects or applications 
um, or apps or whatever is trying to get access to those resources or services. And so that's the kind of relationship between SAML and Xacomel. Uh, now, in terms of the security of SAML itself, um, SAML doesn't really say much um, in, in that sense because uh, for one simple reason, uh, which is that uh, most of that security is communication security related uh, concerns. And um, those can be solved uh, via either uh, whatever security you have in the in the binding okay so or in the implementation um, so if you're um, running your saml communications over an http then if you wanted to add security you should use https um, if it's by any other technology again uh, you should think about the security at the level of that technology however there are some recommendations that saml makes um, so uh, we said that one recommendation already was uh, to use um, encryption uh, to encrypt the identity of the SAML um, requester, okay, or the subject of the SAML um, assertion, in other words. Um, and that could be done um, using XML encryption standard, okay, so or the XML encryption uh, specification, which is again uh, part of the OASIS XML uh, standard. Um, if you're looking to protect the integrity and secrecy of your uh, messages, then as I said, um, that will depend a lot on your uh, binding. So in other words, the implementation itself. Um, so if you are binding your um, SAML um, communications um, over HTTP, uh, then the suggestion here would be to move from HTTP to an HTTPS, where S, of course, is the SSL or what we call uh, TLS standard. Uh, that gives you additional uh, sort of uh, security that protects integrity and secrecy of the messages being exchanged. Uh, bilateral authentication also can be achieved via HTTPS or the SSL or TLS standard um, run within HTTP. Um, and finally, if you wanted to obtain a um, proof of origin um, of the messages, then um, you should use XML signature um, standard for uh, constructing digital uh, signatures. So basically, um, if you wanted to make sure that each message comes from a specific source, then you should be using XML uh, signature for that. Um, now, uh, as an addition to that, SAML also um, recommends to us um, exactly how um, uh, encryption and uh, digital signing should be combined. Uh, so if you are to use both of them, you should first sign and then encrypt, okay, um, and produce a structure which is completely encrypted with the signature inside rather than the other way around, okay. Of course, when you do the reverse, you first decrypt and then you validate the signature, so that goes the, the other way around. But their recommendation is if you're combining digital signatures and encryption, you should first sign and then encrypt not the other way around okay so more information um, about some implementations for saml particularly open saml here um, you can obtain it from a shibboleth website and we move on now to the shibboleth system as in a famous system for implementing the saml uh, markup language <clears throat> Um, so what is Shibboleth? Shibboleth is an open source implementation, as I said, of um, SAML, uh, which uh, provides solution for a federated identity-based uh, management system, okay? And um, that will give you authorization and authentication. Um, uh, 
There are some other implementations as well, but Shibboleth is the most famous, um, famous one. Uh, so we focus on it here. The most important thing or most interesting thing about Shibboleth, apart from being um, an implementation, is that it brings this concept of a directory or uh, what is known as a WAIF or where are you from uh, service. Okay, so uh, it provides uh, this additional uh, concept as we will see in the next following, uh, in the next few slides. Um, so uh, that's the main architecture for Shibboleth. Um, so you have uh, your resources and you have your clients. Um, and of course, the idea here, or the, sorry, the client's home organization or the identity provider, and that's the client's uh, browser. And you're essentially attempting to obtain uh, access to some online uh, resource. Okay, you can find. Uh, more kind of detail of this um, um, architecture from the switch.ch uh, website. The link is uh, below here. Uh, but in addition to these, most importantly, there is the concept of what's known as a wave service or where are you from service. Okay. Um, so the idea here is that you attempt, first of all, to access a resource and then uh, let's say this resource is um, some uh, book that belongs to a, or some digital um, book that belongs to another university okay um, um, so that university then comes back to you and says well hang on I don't really know who you are and um, could you please tell me how I can authenticate you okay so it directs you to this uh, service known as the wave service uh, from which you select exactly uh, the source of your uh, SAML assertion. So that is your specific identity provider that you would like to uh, provide for that uh, external uh, service provider the uh, specific SAML assertions that will allow you to gain access to the uh, digital uh, book or digital asset, whatever it is. <clears throat> Um, so that, that will look like something like this. You will be prompted um, with a web page where you can select uh, from a drop down list uh, uh, the federation, so we call it a federation, uh, which contains all the uh, organizations that trust each other. Okay, and using that federation, then you can specify exactly which is your home uh, organization. Uh, so then you're directed to your home organization um, you are challenged by that home organization so that will look like um, an authentication web page um, if you are successful then it will provide the assertions uh, back to you okay so that will look like something like this okay so it could be like your university of portsmouth authentication page uh, where you are challenged to enter your uh, username and password just so that the University of Portsmouth knows uh, that you are exactly a um, um, subject that belongs to uh, that university. Okay, so if you're successful, um, then the um, home organization will pass the credentials or will pass some kind of uh, reference handle to the credentials so that the, uh, the resource or the service provider uses that handle or reference to obtain the assertions from the home organization. And if, of course, um, the um, if the um, if the assertions are good, then the resource will provide you with, or the resource provider will provide you with the resource that you requested initially, which could be. For example, the digital book that you were um, that you wanted to get access to. Uh, there is a, um, a somehow implementation difference between Shibboleth one and Shibboleth two. Uh, um, we don't concern ourselves much with it, other than to say that um, the instead of returning a handle um, or a reference link uh, to the credentials that 
the resource provider then um, can uh, click on to obtain from the um, user's home organization uh, that those credentials are directly passed through the client to the resource in Shibboleth 2. Okay, um, so uh, therefore it cuts this kind of additional channel of communication between the source, uh, the resource provider and the user's home organization and therefore it minimizes the um, communication load let's say in the system um, but there's also a kind of a cosmetic difference in the sense that also the wave service is uh, was renamed in uh, shibboleth to uh, to become known as the discovery service okay You can find the full description of Shibboleth on their wiki webpage. I would uh, urge you to do that. It's got a lot of uh, good uh, description, good resources, um, and also um, how you can download the implementation of Shibboleth if you are planning in the future to uh, implement a federated um, authentication authorization kind of um, system. Um, it also contains uh, some of these um, diagrams that are related to uh, the uh, how the different entities communicate with one another. Okay, so this is a UML uh, sequence diagram. Uh, so it gives you a good view of how the different entities communicate with one um, another. Uh, right, th this is meant to be more like a demo, but you can... Um, uh, also uh, go directly, uh, for example, to the University of uh, Portsmouth uh, website or to other websites that use um, uh, Shibboleth and you can uh, check it for yourself. Uh, our library uh, does this so you can, if you are accessing, trying to access some kind of uh, resource, say if you are from home and you've uh, provided you're not uh, um, running on your VPN, if you are running on your VPN, you will be already recognized um, so you can get access to the resources directly. There won't be any kind of um, shibboleth intermediated um, uh, communications, but uh, if you are not running over VPN, uh, then um, the following uh, scenario will uh, take place. Okay, so uh, for example, if you try to access a particular uh, resource, uh, say Privacy and Social Freedom, uh, electronic book by Schumann, um, just as an example, um, you will then be directed to um, a WAIF. Uh, service okay and the wave service um, will um, try to ask you exactly which federation you belong to uh, in 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 the uk uh, there is one federation known as the uk federation okay so all the entities that use uh, shibboleth and saml um, they will be subscribed to the uh, uk federation uh, through some kind of uh, process um, registration process um, beforehand okay so they they will have all established trust between one another and certainly uh, all of the UK universities and other universities in the world as well um, uh, you may find them under the uh, UK Federation um, uh, umbrella let's say okay so you're directed uh, to the UK Federation as a source of your um, uh, or as the directory that will uh, contain uh, the your particular uh, home organization and in this case your particular home organization is the University of Portsmouth so what then uh, if you select the University of Portsmouth what will then happen is that the shiblet server will direct you to the web page for the University of Portsmouth okay and then you are kind of prompted to uh, login or in other words to identify yourself to the University of Portsmouth okay so uh, University of Portsmouth uh, asks you exactly who are you okay do you have the username and password you log in you identify yourself and if that is successful uh, then the University of Portsmouth will send the uh, SAML assertion uh, back to whoever um, in this case uh, whichever um, kind of uh, library or uh, service provider was holding that digital asset with themselves. So in this case, 
it would have been a, a University of Cambridge um, library, okay? So um, it will direct uh, that assertion to the University of Cambridge uh, library, which holds that particular electronic book. And um, University of Cambridge library will look at the assertions coming from the University of Portsmouth li um, library and will see, look at them and will say, okay, well, actually, I'm happy that this subject really belongs to the University of Portsmouth because probably I have an agreement with the University of Portsmouth uh, that um, I should provide um, any digital uh, resources I have to subjects coming from Portsmouth, okay? So, and that then will allow you to access your specific uh, book that you requested initially. Um, there is another example which, of the WAVE service, which is IEEE, okay? So again, um, if you are attempting to access IEEE's uh, resources and you're not running on a VPN, if you are running on a VPN, you will be immediately recognized as a University of Portsmouth subject and therefore um, you will see um, yourself um, any resources that are made available to University of Portsmouth by IEEE directly okay so that won't uh, help but if you are not running on a VPN and you are kind of an external user uh, you will see that IEEE will uh, basically confront you with a wave uh, service which will ask you uh, to identify yourself and um, or use some home organization to identify yourself okay so the same process repeats again uh, you are directed back to University of Portsmouth asked to log in um, and then if your login is successful then IEEE you will receive the um, authentication assertion uh, uh, tokens from University of Portsmouth and they will be satisfied that you are a member of the University of Portsmouth uh, organization and therefore uh, you can access any papers or whatever papers IEEE makes available for University of Portsmouth for free. Okay. Um, there are some implementations of uh, Shibboleth test ship is something you can download and run in your organization if you want it as I say to provide a solution uh, for uh, or a solution for federated identity management which is based on uh, shibboleth uh, there are also some web more websites with extra information in shibboleth that i would encourage you to consult so shibboleth.net and their wiki uh, page are very 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 useful uh, as they contain um, a lot of detail um, that clarifies their system. Uh, finally, uh, just last one last word on, on the UK Federation. As I said, UK Federation is an umbrella of trust that links multiple organizations, certainly all of the universities in the UK together. Okay, so if you were uh, authenticating with one university, then you can access the resources from another university. If, if of course, there is an agreement between them to share resources in the first hand. Uh, uh, but the UK uh, Federation itself is as this kind of umbrella of trust, um, or what we call a trust fabric, um, is um, an organization operated by JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee. Um, and it, it, essentially the way it runs is based on X509 certificates. Okay, um, uh, so the different communications are um, which will take place are kind of backed up by X509 certificates to understand exactly who is uh, talking to the other uh, side. Um, it also implements a WAVE service, so that's the um, UK Fed uh, directory. Okay, so you are when you're when you're sent there, the UK Federation will uh, give you a list. Um, of all the organizations that belong to it and then the WAVE service within it will direct you to the specific uh, home organizations uh, login that you have uh, requested or that you've identified yourself as being part of. Okay, There is a um, technical, uh, more sort of a technical description of uh, UK Fed on this link here. Again, I, I would encourage you to consult it um, as it provides more kind of uh, technicalities of how the uh, this kind of 
trust fabric operates uh, or links all the um, organizations that belong to it uh, together and it's certainly backed up by uh, as, as i mentioned a heavy registration process or a vetting what we call a vetting uh, process so when you want to join the federation uh, you have to go through a long uh, process uh, for doing uh, doing that of course uk federation is not the only federation in the world there are lots of other federations um, uh, depending where you are in the world uh, most of them are uh, geography based uh, so they would be regional okay so if you're in europe or in the us or wherever you are um, they would probably have uh, their own uh, federations okay so 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 if you are or if you've got an account with another organization organization somewhere else in the world you need to select the proper federation that that organization belongs to so that you are directed to your home organization to identify yourself okay. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time. Goodbye.